So let's throw our scripture on the screen, our hub scripture for this series. Amen. Y'all turn to 2 Timothy 1.6. This is in the, I picked the English Standard Version because of the way it's worded. I'm going to read the King James, which is normally what I preach out of, but then I'm going to go to the English Standard Version and, and read in it because it kind of amplifies what we want for this series. In the King James, and is everyone standing for the reading of the Word? Amen. Okay, good. That's what we do out here in honor of the Word because it's worthy. In verse 6, it says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands and in a lot of other uh, newer translations it says for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God listen which is come on in you it's in you. So many times as believers, we're wanting something from the outside to come in. And the Lord's like, I've already got it on the inside. I want you to work it out. We're praying for this, that, and the other. And God says, everything that I have, I've put inside of you. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. The fullness of the Godhead bodily is in us. It's amazing. That all of creation is in God and then God puts himself inside of us wow just think about that for a minute Selah and that's why when you get into this word see religion will make you a beggar but this Bible will make you a believer and so you no longer are wishing for something to come into you you know that there is something someone in you and we're working him and his anointing out. Which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He had an experience. We will get to Timothy. We just won't get to Timothy today. But we're going to talk about Timothy. But I thought this was so appropriate for this series. I, I remind you. Why does he have to remind us? Because we forget. If you remember some series uh, back, we're to be thankful because you can't be thankful for what you don't remember. And when you remember, you can be thankful and you can be grateful. And so, right off the bat, I know I got you standing, I'll have you sit down in a second. Right off the bat, the Lord is trying to tell us to, to remember. 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 Because it's so easy for us to forget. I'm going to hit that in a second, but I'm going to let you sit down. Let me pray first. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for what you've done for us on the cross, Lord. Thank you for shedding your bread, blood. Lord, let us in, in this house, Lord, bring your kingdom. Because your kingdom come and your will be done in redemption mobile as it is in heaven, Lord. Thank you. Open the kingdom. Open the kingdom to us, Lord. Show us what you've done. Your full price of redemption, what you paid for, Father. We thank you. We love you. And we glorify you. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Because we, we, we forget things and God has to remind us. Because life happens. How many times have we been in a situation, this, this, the psalm in worship today kind of echoed this, where we are find ourselves in a pinch or trouble's coming or something's not right and we, we, we worry about it or we stress about it and, and then finally, Lord help us. We go to God in prayer. It's come to this, which we should be doing first and foremost. And how many times have we went through something and then we realized like 
on the other side of it that, oh, God's got me through something like this before. And if he was the same God then, well, guess what? He's the same God now. So why are we fretting so much? Because we don't remember. Just as soon as we get out of that jam, it's like we just forget all about it. We turn our attentions to what we want to turn our attentions to next. I'm saying that when the Lord delivers us from stuff, I am imploring you, camp out there. Camp out in that Thanksgiving. Matter of fact, you know, some people have celebration parties when they get their income tax back. You need to put it on your calendar that when God delivers you from something, you need to put it on your calendar, I'm going to go celebrate tonight in worship for what He has done. Make a night of celebrating the Lord and remember what He, He, He has done instead of just saying thank you, God, and just move on to the next crisis in your life or the, or the next I want in life. I don't know about you, but I know that if I'm having a relationship with somebody, I want it to be a two-way street. Yes. That, that when, when it comes to, that's why I have a small circle. Because usually what happens in, 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 is, is, that, is that we make them a priority in our lives, but we're an option in theirs. And then the Lord is saying to us, you are my priority. Why are you making me an option? And yes, he's your go-to guy. But why is he just your go-to guy when there's a need or a problem that arises? Why can't he be a go-to guy just to say hi? Because we love him and we care about him. Because we learned in chasing God about that newness about playing the game of hide and go seek with your child and, and how much they, you want to fellowship with them and they want to fellowship with you and it's the joy of reuniting again when you're, they're, they're off and you're hiding and they find you because you want to be found. They want to find you. <laughs> they, just, they know you're there but they just don't know where the there is. And, but you do, and you want to be found because you want to, be, you want to reunite, and you reunite, and it's so much joy, isn't it? Holding and swinging around and giggling, and, and God says, I want to do that with you every day. Because, why? Because you're a priority in my life. But one message in the message series that I kind of hit, just poop, and then I kind of got off of it. We're, we're, going to, we're going to camp in there because it's one of the basis is for fan the flame is that when they start getting a little older and you send them off to, to, to go play hide and go seek and all of a sudden they, they go into their bedroom and they don't come out of their bedroom. And you're like, what's going on? Instead of them finding you, you go to, you go to find them. You can go ahead and put your name in there. Uh, let's, let's quote some scripture. Adam, where art thou? Where are you? You're supposed to be walking with me in the cool of the day. We have this agreement. We come together because you're a priority in my life. And I don't know if you even thought about that. You are a priority. Let's just say that real slow. You, yes, you are a priority in God's life. God is life. He has a life. He is life. And you are a priority in that life. Amen. And so he wants to reunite with us. But when we're not reuniting, because my aunt is all jacked up and she's calling me three or four times a day about some stuff. Or my kids just got a bad report card and they're acting up a little bit in the house. My husband been coming home a little later than normal. Can't quite figure out why. He says this. Got some questions about it. Don't know. Bill collector's been coming around. Obviously something we thought we took care of didn't get took care of. And so now it's not just X amount of money. There's all kinds of interest coming in. And where art thou? Where art thou? What happened to the reunite? What happened? It don't matter what's going on out there. 
It's time to walk in the cool of the day. It's time to reunite. And the only one that can take care of it all is sometimes the last resort that we go to. Because we'll go out of these, all these friends and family members. We'll, we'll ask Mr. Google and we'll ask Mr. Facebook and we'll go to all these other outside sources. And the only one source that we need to go to, glory be to his name, the only one that can fix it should be first on the priority. We need to let go of these things. That, listen, nobody's saying stick your head in the ground. Nobody's saying that it's just going to disappear, that you don't have, need to think about it and plan on it. But can you put him first? Because if you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness first, all these things will be added unto you. Can we let it go? And say, okay, Lord, we're going to have our time. And in our time with him, can we just commune and fellowship with him? It's almost as if sometimes God doesn't know what's going on and we have to give him the skinny on every little thing. Now, he likes that conversation. He wants you to bring things to him, okay? Don't, don't, don't walk out here thinking God don't want to hear nothing about your problems. But what the deal is is that he already knows so much more than you do. He saw it coming long before you ever did because before Adam knew he had a need, God had a plan. And so where art thou? Where are you at? I just want to commune with you. Because he has put himself inside of us. And he wants to fan into flame. Fan into flame. Where was the passion? Where, was the, where, 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 where did the passion go? Where did the excitement go? Is it no longer fun to hang with me? Is it no longer fun to fellowship with me? I haven't changed, says the Lord. That was real deep. It's real quiet in here, so I must have hit something. I haven't changed. Say it again. God says, I haven't changed. So why is it not fun to fellowship no more? Where art thou? And who told you that? Who told you? Who told you that's so important? Who told you you needed to counsel with them? Who told you that was the priority? Where did that come from? Why don't you come over here to fellowship? Who told you it wasn't fun to fellowship no more? See how slick the enemy comes and slithers in? And if you throw a frog into a bowl and pot, he will jump out immediately. But if you put him in that lukewarm and just slowly turn the temperature up, he'll stay there until he's boiled. And so the enemy doesn't come in like a 800-pound gorilla with a baseball bat and wrecking everything in your life all at once. It might come to that in the end. But it's just so subtle. Just a little at a time. Just a little bit of the world's philosophy here. Just a little bit of Big Mama's doctrine there. Just a little bit of my friend's advice on that. And just a little bit of this movie. And a little bit of that show. And a little bit of this song. And it's just slow, slow. But you're just moving further and further and further and further away. And it used to be fun, but now, where art thou? And what God wants to do is fan. Listen, where, look at the scripture says, For this reason I remind you, I remind you to fan the flame. It is up to us to fan the flame. God does not change. I've said it before, I'll say it again. God does not increase. God does not learn. 
He already is everything. He can't get no bigger. Can't get no smarter. And he says to you, because he changes not, I didn't change. I'm still here in the garden walking. Where art thou? And who told you that? Because here I am and I change not and I love you and I want to spend time with you. I'm still having just as much fun as I used to have. Why are you not having as much fun as you used to have? Because like I said, he's God. He doesn't change. He's just as awesome as he was yesterday. Yeah. Knows just as much as he did the first time you begged and pleaded and said, God, please save my life and you almost died. He loves you just as much as the day that you gave your life to him and you were broken and in tears. He doesn't change. I'm still that good. How come you won't come taste and see anymore? Won't you come to my dining table and eat what I've provided for you anymore? Why is your diet changing? I know there are a lot of places that I've traveled to all over the world. There's some things that are okay and some things that are not okay to eat just for personal, I'm talking about just personal taste. But they say it's an acquired taste. I didn't know what that meant earlier in my life. I kind of have a better understanding on it now. But something that if you have a steady diet of, you eventually learn to kind of like it or tolerate it at least. Like years ago when I used to smoke, um, I could tell the difference between brands of cigarettes. I mean, for somebody who's just taking a puff, they inhale it in, they're coughing, it's like, <laughs> but they want to be cool or look up to somebody or think they need it or whatever. The, there's an ins, there, there's a, um, insufficient part of their life, and they're trying to fill it with something, so they're going to throw this in there. But it's just smoke, but you do it long enough, you can tell the difference. I never understood this either. A lot of my buddies that I used to run with years ago they like beer. I can't stand the taste of the stuff. It's just nasty. Yeah, all of it's nasty. I can remember one time that they were like, well, this is an in, in, imported such and such. You got, it's real expensive. You know, we got a hold of this. You don't get this very often. And have a sip of it. You'll, that'll be the difference. I took a sip of it. It still tastes like I've never tasted pee, but I imagine that's what it would taste like <laughs> if it was. That's just me. And, and, and I'm going to hit it home on this, too, same way with coffee. I just don't get it. They said it's an, uh, an acquired taste. I don't like coffee. I have not only tried the, the supposed best brews, I have literally been in Honduras outside a bean tree where they got the beans off the tree and they ground them right there. When you ordered it, they picked, they ground, and they handed you, and it still tasted like Folgers. I don't know. Whatever. So I realize that there's some things in life that have an inquired taste to it. And God's saying, why don't you enjoy me so much now? What have you been hooked on? Because you're acquiring a taste for something else besides me. And it didn't shock you back here. Oh, I said that backwards. It shocked you back here. Now it's not that big of a deal. The great compromise. You see, before the enemy crushes you, the enemy will compromise with you. Say that again. Before the enemy will crush you, he will compromise with you. He'll play, let's make a deal. Go ahead and go to church. Go ahead and pray and go ahead and read your Bible. But you know it's, so, it's fun. You enjoy it. This too. And... and Preacher up there saying you don't need to run with these people no more. I mean, he had your back in third grade. Don't you remember when Big Ed come around, that bully that failed three times in a row, but they won't kick him out of school, and he's three grades ahead of you, and he come and he'd put your head down in the toilet, and you were quick, quick, kicking and screaming, and he might have held it in there too long if it hadn't been for your bro here. And you just going to diss them? But see, God's the whole time telling you, but... You've come to me in your mind. I, I'm still after them. They, they ain't mine yet. And they're still like their father of the devil. And they're so into the world. And all the things that they're doing is going to bring destruction to your life. They're still drinking heavy or they're into drugs. or 
they lie still, cheat, whatever the deal may be. You, you can have a whole slew of stuff. They could just be busybody gossips, amen. Everybody, they know everybody's business. And the Lord says, I want to disassociate that for you because my word says that bad company creates bad morals. And I have drawn you unto myself and I want you to be holy. And all of a sudden that when you come into the kingdom, you saw this and you got your new set of friends. And the Lord has provided people that you can get to know within the church or in the community that have your, listen, your best interests in heart. A friend that says, come on, you got to come down and kick it down here tonight because it's half price, 25 cent shots. They're letting the ladies in free for the first hour. You got to come on down. Come on, we're just going to have a fun time tonight. You don't have to tell your pastor anything. God knows he's God's, he's God's child. But all of a sudden, it's like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But the more and more you compromise, the more and more, listen, don't, God is not mocked. He said it. He is not mocked. He doesn't have it in for you. The only thing he has in for you is to love you and to have fellowship with you, to bless you. But he says, I'm not going to be mocked. You get so familiar with familiar, the old life, to where now you're compromising. And you want this and you want that. But the Lord also says that if you straddle the fence, I will spew you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. Yes, I just quoted scripture for all those. The only reference you have of Jesus is grandma's picture of the little lamb around his head. And he's just so somber looking like, like he would never do nothing like that anyways. That man, that right there, the man, Jesus Christ, said that if you're lukewarm, he'd just put you out of his mouth. Either be hot or cold. You compromise to something. And you're boiling in water and you don't even know it because the heat gets turned up just a little at a time. No more shock effect. Glory be to God. And so God's there saying, you fan into flame. It's a story of a local pastor that there was a member that quit coming and this was back when you actually could make house visits, amen, <laughs> where you didn't have no trespassing and beware of dog signs on every other house. Amen. You could actually go knock on somebody's door without worrying about getting shot or bit. Amen. And so he was missing some services, so the pastor come by, and this guy was a headstrong kind of guy, and he wanted to do his own thing, and, you know, his wife was all into church, all into God, and he was just thinking about it, playing with it, playing the part, didn't know if he really wanted to do it all or not because he wasn't ready to let go of everything. But he noticed his life started going down the tubes, and like I said, it will. Just give it time. The only problem is, is deception. The whole thing of deception is you don't even know you're being deceived. And so he goes in there, and he's not going to beat nobody over the head. He's not going to you know, whip out five or six scriptures. I mean, the dude already knows why he's there. Already knows. So they're by a fireplace, and the pastor goes and... He kind of piddles with the fire a little bit and he takes an ember and he kind of knocks it away from the fire a little bit and puts the poker down. They just talk about normal talk, sports, weather, just odds and ends. And that gentleman is noticing, well, why did he kick that ember, you know, over there? He, he, obviously, he's wanting me to know something because, like I said, he knows why the pastor's there. So the pastor's trying to tell him something. What, you know, what's he trying to say without saying it? I ain't going to kick him out of my home, but I wish he'd get on with it. And so they sit there a few more minutes, and the guy notices. Finally, he asks, he says, why did you kick that ember over there? He says, well, well what does it look like? He says, well, it's just kind of gray and charcoal looking. I mean, you know, it's kind of dead looking. Why why'd you want to do that? And he goes, yeah, it does. It, it sure does, doesn't it? So the pastor gets up, and he takes the, the fire poker, and he takes the, that ember, and just kicks it just a little ways right there next to the fire, sets it in, goes back to talking small talk, this, that, the other. The guy's like, yeah, he's trying to teach me something. 
He says, what are you trying to say, Pastor? She says, well, what about that ember? What does it look like now? He says, oh, well, it's bright and glowing and shiny. He says, yep, it is. He says, you take it away from the fire, it's going to get dull and lifeless every time. But if you bring it back into the fire, it's always going to light right back up. But it was up to the guy to fan the flame. Are you going to get back into the fire? Are you going to commune with God? Are you going to put yourself in that place? Because you're an ember and you already have it in you. You just got to get closer to the fire. Because what God wants us to understand through this whole series I mean, this is going to cover, this fan the flame, this is if I could have just a sentence of what in the world is this message about. Listen, God starts the fire. Man sustains the fire. God starts the fire. And man sustains the fire. And we're going to go into details through this series of different people and different Situations throughout Scripture. Amen? But the Master even said in the book of John, He says, No one can come unto me unless my Father in heaven draws him. No one. So that tells you right there that God always, from Genesis to Revelation, God is the initiator. Because God is a consuming fire. God is light. God is life. God is love. God is. Hallelujah. And so he's always the initiator. He always comes to you first. As the master said, no one can come unto me unless the Father draw him till the Holy Spirit comes and and enlightens them that you need a God and he's real and he wants you. There's many that are going to say no, but praise God, there's many that are going to say yes. And God is the initiator who comes to the hearts of every man. You can check it out. I mean... Adam was nothing but lifeless bunch of clay formed. He was just basically a doll until Ruah, the breath of God, he breathed it into Adam and he became a living soul. Adam opened his eyes. A living spirit, I should say. A living spirit. God initiated that with man. God's the one that come to Noah and said, hey, I'm going to tap you on the shoulder. Everybody else is crazy. Cray, cray. Cray, cray all day. I want you to do this for me. Before then, God, listen, God made himself known. I mean, you, you think about, well, Adam sinned and God went 10 zillion miles away and wouldn't like, right after that, God made tunics, had a sacrifice, and covered them. He didn't say, you filthy, nasty scoundrel of a worm, like you've heard from pulpits before. He didn't say that. God did not say that. He said, what are you doing naked? Listen, I love you so much, I'm going to cover you. And he does it today, the ultimate sacrifice with his son. I want to cover you. Because if I wrap you all up in my son, that's who I see. Because that's who I want to see because I love you. And I'm after you. And I'm going to pursue you. And I'm going to cover you. And not too long after that, Cain and Abel. God was talking with both of them. You make it sound like that God was a zillion miles away. God was talking with both of them. And matter of fact, when Cain got jacked up, 
God sent himself, God himself come to have a specific conversation with him. God still speaks. God still wants to commune with man. Even in the fall, even before our redemption, God still wanted to have an association and a fellowship with man. And we see that it, you know, it didn't, it was not limited as much as you wanted, as much as you could have. Because even after he was communing with Cain and Abel and talking with them, it wasn't too long after that that we find out there was a man called Enoch who did ex who who did who let go of everything in life, and all he wanted to do was play the fellowship game with God. That's all he wanted to do. I mean, there was nothing else but that. And you know what? You know what God did, don't you? God said, there "Ain't no use in us having this barrier between us. Come on up." Hallelujah. We said with Noah already. You can go after that. Abraham's on the scene. God reaches out to Abraham. God reaffirms it to Isaac. I'm the God of your father. To Jacob, I'm the God of your father and your father's father. Yeah. Says it to Joseph. Gives him a dream. We can go on and on and on. He's always initiating. So we can't produce the fire. But that's okay. God does. And God starts the fire. He will always start the fire. From the very first, as the master said, once again, I think this is the third time I've said it, you can't come to me unless the father draws you. He initiates that. Whether it's a preacher, or whether it's even something in a movie, or a, God has a bazillion ways of getting your attention. It's just that when you see it, do you want to stare at it, or do you want to close your eyes? Because I could turn every light on here, and this is not even close to how bright it can get in here. Praise God, we can get this room real bright. I could have it as bright as it would get, and, it, and at any time I can close my eyes, and I'm in the dark. So it doesn't matter how bright the light shines around you, are you going to close your eyes or not? And so the Lord will always, listen, He starts the fire. Where I think we have missed it, is that we think he's the sustainer of the fire. But yet, as we'll see through this series, we are to fan the flame. I hear it about Christians, especially those that were really messed up and they got the hold of the real Jesus, not just, Lord, I've been arrested and now I've got this in my life. I got a record. I was in a gang, whatever the deal may be. And they're really coming for some kind of refuge just just so God just, I don't want the consequences to hit me like a thousand pound brick. Save me from that. I'm not talking about lip service where there's no repentance, there's just remorse. I'm talking about really, I gave my life to Jesus and, I, and, and if there, listen, if there, if there is no change, there was no change. When you get saved, you're a babe Christian, you're in diapers, and you may poop on yourself every now and then, but you will see growth yeah. because it's not just you in you no more. There's someone else in you, and there will be a change. Hallelujah. And God is saying, I have put the fire in you. And so many people that get radically saved, and they're just on fire for God. You can hear the old timers be like, well, that won't last. I guess, no, if you've fed a doctrine all your life of that and you've been told that all your life, yet when I get into the Word, I see that we are to fan the flame because the fire never burns, the God's fire never burns out. It's just that are we an ember that's moved away? And our life is seeming dead and cold and stagnant and gray and But yet, if we fan the flame and move ourselves closer to the fire, all of a sudden that ember in our life will perk up. We'll start burning bright again. So anytime you're not burning bright, where are you at? Where art thou? Because you'll always burn brighter in the fire. And God starts it. He's faithful. But are we going to sustain what he starts. Are we going to fan the flame? 
Because now he gives us the choice. You're still going to walk with me in the cool of the day? Or are you going to go over here and walk with Jojo and Pookie and Billy Ray? Or are you going to walk with me? Because you have to fan the flame. I'll start the fire. You can't do that. We can't do his part and he won't do ours. I think some of y'all missed that. Let me say it slow. We can't do his part and we can't do his. Amen. Or he won't do us. I'm sorry. He won't do ours. Joke come back on me, didn't it? So he starts it, but it's up to us to sustain it. See, fire is represented as the symbol of God's presence. Matter of fact, throw it up on the screen, Deuteronomy 4, 24. Fan the flame. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. He's a consuming fire. Fan the flame. Yeah, but that was Moses in the law. Put up Hebrews 12, 29. I guess the apostle, well, some, most people think it was the apostle Paul that wrote Hebrews. Maybe, he, maybe, maybe we're so smart we, we, we got the memo, but the apostle Paul didn't. Because by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and I guess the Holy Ghost didn't get the memo either. Because on the New Testament it says, For our God is a consuming fire. He don't change. You can always get the heat when you meet. Well, I'm feeling cold. Well, you just need to get bold. Now, what it says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Because when y'all get to meet, you're going to feel the heat. The warmness. Sometimes the correction. We went over that, I think it was last week. But the love, because when there's no rules, there's no love. Who in the world is going to let their children go out and do stuff they're not ready for? I think I've given this analogy more than once. It's the best one I've got, so you all just have to hear it again. It's the Super Bowl. You forgot your favorite wing sauce. You don't want to get up, but you want that on your wings. But the game has started. You had poor planning. You don't look at your seven-year-old, hand them your credit card, throw them the keys and say, all right, sport, go down to Publix and get me some X sauce. Was there anything wrong with driving? I do it all the time. Is it wrong and sinful to have a car? It's a blessing. It's the right thing, but it was at the wrong time. Hallelujah. And so the Lord wants to meet with us. And when we meet, we feel the heat. And that's fanning the flame. Remembering what He's done for you. Communing with Him. Having serious conversations. Read the book of Psalms. I love it. David is just straight up with God. Sometimes it's glory to your name. Sometimes, Lord, we got to talk about this. You don't listen. You don't have to come to God, get on your knees in an exact manner, hold your hands just right, and speaketh Elizabeth Englisheth, thou God most high, I reverence thee today. I wot not in my life, but thou knowest all things. He just wants to commune with you. And he understands your language. Amen. Amen. So, fire is not only a symbol of his presence, it's an instrument of his power. And the way of either approval or destruction. And there could not be a better symbol for the fi- uh, God than the fire. 
It's immaterial, it's mysterious, but it's visible, it's warming, it's cheerful, comforting, but it's also could be terrible and can consuming. It's used for sacrificial purpose and the respect paid to it. But fire also carries the symbolism of light and of purification. I mean, I could hit all these symbolic uh, symbolisms in Scripture and pull them out and see the significance. But the one that we're going to hunker down on through this series is the symbolism of passion. Passion. Fan the flame or put into practice your passion because your heart will be passionate for something. You can't turn your heart off, but you can direct it because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. What you value is where your passion's going to be. And God is a consuming fire. And He will start a fire in you. And He wants you to sustain that fire. He wants you to hold on to that passion. He doesn't change. We change. And He doesn't go anywhere. We tend to stray. Amen. And fire is also used for cooking. And the forging of many types of metals used for a variety of different things. But as I said, I want to focus in on the symbolism of passion for this series. Because God starts it, but we've got to sustain it. And I've got to teach it. Because we need to be God chasers. We need to be chasing God. He wants to be in our lives so much. He wants to reunite with us on a daily basis, not just when things are bad, when things are bleak, when trouble comes. When the water rises high and the valley is deep. He wants to be in the good times too, the joyful times. He wants to celebrate the joys with you and he wants to bind your wounds when you get into trouble or hurt. He wants to be a part of every aspect of, sometimes I know that's hard to believe, but he wants to be in every aspect of our lives. Well, that doesn't mean you have to ask him which kind of toothbrush to use. I mean, I'll, I'll, granted, there's people that go way overboard. Lord, you want me to buy this toothbrush or that toothbrush? This breath mint or that breath mint? Which one is it, Lord? Should I wear my white shoes today? Is that why I'm, I'm not, I'm, I can't make up my mind? I should have worn my gray shoes? I don't know. Which shoes should I wear today, Lord? I, uh, people go way overboard. But see, the Lord knows what you like and what you don't like. Just like if you take a kid into a toy store and you're going to buy them some candy, you say, get what you want. But he wants to be in every aspect of our life. Are we going to let him? Because he started the fire. But we have to sustain that fire. So are you going to fan the flame? 